PRI's podcast. I'm your host, Romina Ichon. This episode is a departure from our usual fare. Our guest isn't a policy wonk or a lawmaker or even a pundit. We went for artsy this time, conservative political cartoonist Michael Ramirez. Tim and I, PRI's Director of Communications, and I tried our best to get in the mind of a political cartoonist. How does he get his ideas? What's the process? What kind of hate mail does he get? Did he say when he was a kid, when I grow up, I want to be a political cartoonist? We think you're all in for a treat with Michael Ramirez. He's a two-time Pulitzer Prize winner, and his work is distributed in hundreds of newspapers nationwide. Also, his latest book, Give Me Liberty or Give Me Obamacare, is on Amazon. And if you're lucky enough to be listening to this podcast, Michael Ramirez will be PRI's guest speaker on Tuesday, December 19th at the Maritime Wine Bar in San Francisco. Go to our website for the details. Thanks for joining us. Welcome to PRI's podcast, Michael. For our listeners who may not be familiar with your story, tell us a little bit about how you gained an interest in drawing cartoons and and how you became one of the nation's most talked about political cartoonists. You know, it's curious because I I never really had an interest in being a political cartoonist. It's something that I sort of stumbled into. In fact, all my brothers and sisters are doctors and their spouses are doctors. And so I'm the black sheep of the family. And uh, I was kind of joking in a speech the other day, uh, somebody asked me uh, in a speech and Chicago, you know, do you get death threats? And what was the death, first death threat you ever got? And I said, well, you know, you get death threats all the time because people are emotionally invested in their, in, their, in their politics, which is the way it ought to be. But the first death threat I got was when I graduated from college. I told my parents I was going to take a year off from medical school to become a political cartoonist and they threatened to kill me. I never imagined being a political cartoonist. I grew up reading the newspaper with my dad every morning at the uh, breakfast table. We had the LA Times and the Orange County Register, which are two diverse political ideologies. And uh, my friend Paul Conrad was uh, in the LA Times on the left, and my friend Jeff McNelly was in the Orange County Register on the right. And I love the cartoons, but I never thought about doing it. But I, I've always been curious about how, how everything works. I love newspapers. Really, information is a great commodity. And uh, I, I love the fact that you could read about the world in these newspapers. So I've always had that interest, and I've always had opinions on everything. But it wasn't until I got into college that I actually drew my first political cartoon. And and that came about as an accident because um, I wrote for the newspaper. When I was in high school, I was the high school newspaper, but I didn't draw political cartoons. In college, I continued to write. And then I was a a triple major in college, biological sciences, fine art studio painting, and art history. I only only took the latter two because my brothers and sisters who had preceded me to end the medical school said that medical schools were were looking for more well-rounded candidates. And that would help me to get into uh, med school. And so I was it's doing that because I always had the ability to look at something and draw. And UCI had a very conceptual art department and I could make up really uh, good excuses for bad art as well as anybody else. You know, one day I was carrying a painting in that I was working on uh, into the uh, new university, which was our high, uh, college newspaper's office. And I was filing a story. My editor said, I didn't know you could draw. Why don't you do a political cartoon on the student election? And so in seeing these guys and uh, looking at their stands, they had no real platform they're running on. It was more of a popularity contest. So I did a a cartoon making fun of all the candidates. And sure enough, when that uh, image hit the newsstands, we had three days of protests over this cartoon. We had so many protests, the student government asked me to come before them and apologize to the school because I needed to be educated. And I I suddenly realized all this time I'd been writing, uh, you know, I did uh, opinion pieces. Nobody really cared. But you draw one cartoon and everybody hates you. Now, what a great forum for my views. And so I appeared in front of the front of the student government, I said, they're absolutely right. I do need to be educated, which is why I was pursuing three degrees. But thank you for their concern. And that launched my political cartooning career. I, I, I sort of just did it on the side, though, for fun. It was it was right after that that a local newspaper, the Newport Ensign in Newport Beach, California, uh, offered me a job uh, where I could draw a cartoon on California and national topics, and they would pay me $50. And I, I had this long stretch between organic chemistry and bio 101, where I would just go surfing at the beach and these guys would pay me $50 to do a cartoon and I could do it in about 20 or 30 minutes and it was a pretty good deal all around. Now in my junior year, there was an incident where the Newport Beach police had pulled over this gentleman 
gentleman, uh, arrested him for drunk driving, didn't allow him a phone call, kind of roughed him up. And it turned out that that gentleman was a city councilman who didn't drink. And so I drew, drew a cartoon where I had this guy hogtied on the hood of a police car with his shoe wedged in his mouth. And the arresting officer was explaining to his sergeant, I was merely reinforcing his constitutional right to remain silent. And when that cartoon came out in the paper, there was a huge reaction to it. In fact, the uh, police chief, the Newport Beach police chief came down to the office, yelled at the publisher, yelled at the editor and trying to find out where I lived. And it was that moment I realized, you know, that, that this cartoon could have a huge impact on for the political dialogue out there. And I think that's when I fell in love with it. I'm curious about your typical process that you go about when you set about to draw a political cartoon. So how do you go about choosing your subjects? How long does it take to draw them typically? And how far in advance do you usually draw your cartoons? You know, Tim, the, the problem with editorial cartooning is you're really limited because you only have one window to pronounce these views. You're really limited to the information that pe- that's dispelled out there uh, among the uh, majority of the population. And, and that's kind of a setback because there's some issues I'd like to tackle, but there's just not enough space to explain them in an editorial cartoon. Because ed- an editorial cartoon is sort of like, it's like an advertisement. You've got five seconds to engage the reader, to draw them in, and five seconds to make the, p- the sales pitch. And that doesn't give you a lot of time to really get into the details of a lot of these complex issues. So it has to be something that people understand. So, I, you know, I watch, the, I, I read three or four newspapers a day, starting early in the morning. I, I watch television at every half hour increment to see sort of what is on the is on the public awareness level. You know, what, what news is being broadcast so that uh, people understand uh, what's going on. To, to, to kind of see what's being absorbed by the American consciousness. Drudge is a great platform because I think a lot of the major networks utilize Drudge as a launching point to, to big stories. But I read, I'm, I'm boring. My job is mostly about reading and gathering information and processing the information. From that point, it becomes a timeliness issue because like any other uh, profession, you're really selling these things. So it has to be kind of timely. So it has to be whatever is uh, you know on the radar for the majority of the nation. That's very, very important. I want to pick things that I think are more substantive. I'm a big believer in editorial, cartoon, uh, editorial cartooning as substantive journalism. So it's not just a funny picture. It's, a, it's an instrument of journalism. Um, and, uh, you know, like any with any editorial, it has a point. And I think that's the most important element of a cartoon. So I'm trying to drive that point. So whatever is the big news of the day usually becomes a topic. Now, my problem these days is there's such, an, you know, with the, with the crazy nature of politics, there's lots of ideas. In fact, I probably come up with about 15 or 20 ideas a day. And the hardest part of my job is narrowing it down to the, you know, one or two ideas that I decide to go with. And then what I'll do, uh, Tim, is I've got, you know, write all my ideas down on these little cocktail napkins. And then the best of those ideas I'll transpose to um, copy paper and I'll scan them into my computer. And then I send them out to about 13 or 14 of my friends uh, whose judgment I trust and let them pick out their favorites and uh, let them put them in chronological order according to the importance of the issue. And then, you know, sort of take a polling of what they all believe in and then completely ignore them and just do the one that I want. Michael, you alluded to the crazy politics today. Certainly there's no shortage of subjects these days for a great political cartoon. What are some of your favorite subjects to draw about today? Well, you know, obviously um, what's going on domestically uh, is important. I'm a byproduct of the Reagan administration. That's really when I first entered politics in a big way. And, uh, you know, the tax cuts, I think, are big issues only because in America, we're supposed to be the representation of free market economics. And yet we have the highest corporate taxes in the world. And I think that's directly responsible. That and, and uh, you know, the $1.5 trillion cost for regulations of impeding our economic growth. That's important. And and then you look at uh, the result of the Obama years, which is just putting the world in complete chaos. In fact, my the book that I came out w- uh, with uh, last year, which was called Give Me Liberty or Give Me Obamacare, talks about domestically this massive expansion of entitlements at the same time throwing the world in chaos by the worst foreign policy in history. Because 
because of the Obama administration, we live in a profoundly more dangerous world, especially for Americans. And so those are those issues are on my radar. In fact, I, I'm I'm very worried about uh, the dynamics in today's geopolitics with Iran on the cusp of developing nuclear weapons and uh, de- developing uh, ballistic missile, three-stage ballistic missile technology that will allow it to strike anywhere. And of course, Korea already has that. But beyond these these issues, which you know are an affront to the civilized world because these guys are, you know, they sponsor a lot of surrogates of evil, is the nuclear arms race that's going to develop because of these developments in both regions. And so now we have nine nuclear powers in the world. Uh, with a nuclear Iran, there are an additional 13 nations in the African continent and the Middle East that want to develop nuclear technology as well. It's been hard enough to keep fissionable material out of the hands of, of uh, you know, bad agents. Imagine what it's going to be like when you have 21 or 22 nuclear countries out there in areas that have very little respect for human life that will sell anything and lots of surrogates of evil. I think it becomes a far more dangerous world. So all of these things domestically and in in the world, I think America has a lot of challenges. So Michael, who are some of your favorite subjects to draw about? (laughs) Well, you know, I I always joke uh, when people ask me, you know, how do you come up with your cartoon ideas? I always joke that I, I have the best gag writers in the world working for me. They're called politicians. And, uh, you know, that's the strength of, of our um, democratic republic. Is that the bottom line is the government works for us. Uh, it's not the other way around. Although you would think uh, with all the taxes we pay, with all the regulations, with all the things that are going on, it's we who work for the government. At least I feel that way, uh, you know, t- until I get past uh, at least April 15th. But really the politics and the craziness of the politics has just been uh, perfect targets for what I do. And you look at, uh, as I mentioned, you know, Obama was a, was one of my absolute favorite administrations from the point of view that it was so chaotic and the, and so destructive in many levels uh, that that's just made for great editorial cartoons. You're doing it in an effort to try to preserve the constitutional foundation of our country because there's so many things that I think the last administration did that were unlawful, uh, that were bad for uh, the American people and bad for geopolitics. But, you know, continuing that trend, we've seen an exercise for the last eight years of these progressive policies that have been abject failures. The people that advocate for these things, and it seems like we're getting to the lunatic fringe on the left side where you have the uh, Elizabeth Warrens and the, the Chuck Schumers that are pushing more to the fringe of the left. And the dynamics of this movement through millennials of embracing socialism and failed progressive politics and policies of entitlement. But those are all great targets as well, it, mostly because I think they're bad for the United States. It's been proven uh, that these things undermine our constitutional foundation and are unsustainable. You know, it's like what Margaret Thatcher used to say, which is uh, socialism is a great idea until you run out of other people's money. So over the years, you've won two Pulitzer Prizes and seemingly every other award that you can think of for your work. So looking back through all of your drawings over the years, do you have maybe one or two that stand out as ones that you're most proud of? And could you describe those for us? Sure. I mean, there, there are several that, that I love. One of my favorite cartoons that I did, uh, which I think epitomized what the perfect editorial cartoon is, is I have this kind of tattered American flag, and it's just called the uh, the fabric of our nation. And you can see that it's slowly unraveling. And it's just a singular visual image where you look at it and you just see the flag unraveling and it's the, the message is immediate and it's very hard hitting. has a great point. I think those make the best editorial cartoons. Another one of my my favorites is I've got a, a, a dual panel cartoon where in the first panel I've got a bunch of Cro-Magnon kind of old Neanderthal type figures dancing around a stone pillar and it says in ancient times people worship the stars out of ignorance and in the next panel I've got a bunch of uh, tux clad and gown clad uh, Hollywood celebrities dancing around an Oscar. I think the ones that uh, sort of grasp the real events that are going on, the current events and the ridiculousness of the situation I think those ones also speak volumes. Like in the uh, in my uh, last Pulitzer collection, <clears throat> at the very end, there's the issue of global warming and Sheryl Crow had addressed the issue by saying that people ought to just use one square 
toilet paper per bathroom visit to combat global warming. And I drew this cartoon where I have this guy and he's standing on stage, the, her manager with another gentleman, and he's saying, meet Cheryl Crow. She, she uses only one square of toilet paper per bathroom visit to fight global warming. And she's holding her hands out to shake the guy's hand. And he's just kind of looking at her hand. Um, you know, I, I think that the most iconic cartoons are the ones that show the hypocrisy or the injustice out there. And the impact is immediate. It defines the issue. Uh, it, you know, those are the best cartoons. Michael, both Tim and I have um, worked with many politicians and we know that they can be notoriously thin skinned. So I imagine you are probably permanently banned from the White House and congressional <laughs> Christmas parties based on your cartoons over the years. What kind of feedback have you gotten from your more famous political subjects? You know, you get a lot of feedback and that, that's really good. In fact, when I was at the LA Times, you know, filling in for Paul, I had Paul Conrad's old office. And one of the things I used to do, you know, I've been investigated by the Secret Service. <laughs> I've, been, I've had uh, protests by both right and left groups at the same time. When you make people mad, then you're doing your job um, because people won't react unless something really uh, gets their you know, really gets their craw that makes them energetic enough to respond. No, but I'll, I'll tell you, when when I won my first Pulitzer in '94, I got a wonderful letter from the president and her husband, Bill Clinton, at the time, and uh, it was a letter congratulating me for the Pulitzer. It was very nice. So I gathered all my Clinton cartoons, and that was some of my favorite era. You know, I did one where I had Bill Clinton saying, I did not have factual relations with the American people. <laughs> I, I had him with uh, his dog, Buddy, sitting at the vet. And Buddy's thinking, like, I'm the one who needs to be neutered. So I, I gathered all these Clinton cartoons and I put them in a package and I, I wrote him a note back that said, thank you very much for your kind letter. I couldn't have done it without you. <laughs> and I sent it back to the White House. And I thought it was funny until I got audited four and a half months later. So, you know, who had the last laugh there? But, you know, naturally, you do get responses. You do. You get them from uh, the politicians that are usually the target. Now, most politicians uh, politicians have a pretty thick skin. There are a few that don't. And I think what's more frustrating than anything is when you do uh, a cartoon on your target and then they want a copy of the cartoon. Then you just didn't do your job. And fortunately, I, mean, I haven't had a, a whole lot of those. Mostly just complaints. Michael, you know, satire is as American as apple pie. And I think political cartoons are really probably the most high profile types of satire that people see every day. You know, it's how we poke fun at ourselves and also, too, I think, how we get through some very tough times. What role do you think political cartoons play both in our daily lives and in shaping our American culture? You know, hopefully it's going to be the catalyst for thought. It's going to incite the public so that they will think about these issues and return politics back to its ground level, which is grassroots, which is that uh, we, the people, uh, run this this government, this democratic republic. Uh, you know, one thing I don't like in modern political cartooning is it just seems the modern trends uh, kind of leans more toward making simple jokes about current affairs, so, sort of like the Tonight Show monologue. Uh, but I, I, I think, you know, humor without making a substantive statement diminishes the importance of the editorial cartoon. I'm a big believer in the role that we play to be that catalyst, to inform the public, to make sure that they understand what our government is doing to us and what role they should, they should play. I think editorial cartoons probably have a bigger impact than most editorials because people are drawn to the illustration. So frankly, uh, they're more aware of what the cartoon is saying rather than reading, you know, a 200-word editorial or 90-word editorial. So I'm a big believer that you have to carefully craft the cartoon, substantiate your point of view before you even decide to do the cartoon. And sometimes the important decision is deciding whether or not to do the cartoon. And one of the uh, examples I always use when I give speeches is that, uh, uh, you know, sometimes you should contemplate the cartoon carefully and it'll lead you sometimes to not doing the cartoon. Uh, for instance, when uh, Johnny Cochran died, of course, everybody knows Johnny Cochran was the uh, lead of the defense team for O.J. Simpson and got him off uh, on the murder trial. And so when he died, the first image that came to mind was, you know, Johnny Cochran at the gates of heaven with St. Peter. And St. Peter was saying, I'm sorry, Johnny, if the halo don't fit, we don't admit <laughs> But after a careful examination of, you know, Cochran's career, I found him to be a very generous man who was engaged with his community, doing a lot of terrible things. And it seemed unfair to define him by one case. And so I didn't do the cartoon. So those those are the types of decisions I think 
you have to make. Because I, I'm a big believer in editorial cartooning and serious journalism, that uh, we're trying to have an impact. Um, you know, we get to stretch the truth. We get to exaggerate things. But I think the essence of the cartoon still has to be valid. Michael, when you sit down to draw a political cartoon, what is your ultimate goal? Making people laugh or making people think? Well, you know, when I was growing up, uh, as I mentioned before, I, I, um, I used to read Paul Conrad's cartoons in the LA Times and Jeff McNally's in the Orange County Register. Jeff at the time, I think, was a political cartoonist for the um, uh, the Richmond Times Dispatch. And they had two different styles. Paul Conrad drew these very somber, dark, foreboding images, very powerful, powerful, dark cartoons. Jeff was the most amazing illustrator. <clears throat> and what he did was he drew these wonderful illustrations that were funny but had powerful points. One thing I learned is that humor is a very, very powerful weapon, that uh, you could use humor to reach a much larger audience with your message. And the bottom line when it comes to political cartoons is to reach as many people as possible, to be as pers persuasive as possible to your point of view. So, you know, the bottom line on that question is, I think, making a point, making people think is the most important element of a cartoon. But making them laugh allows you to reach a much larger portion of the public with your message. So it could be, um, it can have a serious point, but humor allows it to, to be digested uh, a lot more easily. And, you know, I'm I'm a knuckle-dragging right-wing Neanderthal. And people, most of the people who read my cartoons know that, although I'm, I'm an equal opportunity offender. If you can make a cartoon interesting enough, if you can make it funny enough, you're going to reach beyond the political spectrum that agrees with you. And I think that's important. I'm a big believer in editorial cartoons because I'm a big believer in America. We have the greatest country in the world, a country that's, uh, you know, a government that's run by the people and for the people, but only if the people get engaged. And I hate the fact that more Americans aren't engaged on a grassroots level with the politics. We have this great country. So I'm a big believer in what I do as a political cartoonist to be sort of the, the method to get people involved. And we, in visiting, you know, I've been to Iraq and I've been to Afghanistan. I know what the price is for this liberty and freedom that so many people take for granted. My job is just to get you guys engaged in self-governance. Michael, in this age of political correctness, you know, it's pretty clear that too many people can't take a joke these days, and I'm sure this certainly extends to political cartoons. What kind of feedback do you get regularly from your readers, and do you ever decide to go in a different direction in drawing a cartoon or maybe avoiding a subject just to avoid the angry emails and phone calls uh, coming into the newsroom? Tim, that's why I use your bio and your home address on my bio so that I could say whatever I feel like <laughs> without any repercussions whatsoever. You know what? Um, in this game, and as an editorialist, you get a pretty thick skin. And, uh, you know, I say what I say because I believe absolutely in what I what I write. And uh, that's done as a result of substantiating my point of view before I even uh, take pen to paper. So, you know, I'm aware of the dynamics of politics and, you know, people are entrenched in their ideas. And no matter what you do, that you're going to have a body of people that are going to disapprove of what you say. So I, I'm well beyond that. I, I don't have any problems with the hate mail and the vitriol that you get from doing these cartoons. Now, having said that, just like I don't believe that uh, editorial cartoons ought to be humorous anecdotes about current events, that you don't uh, draw humorous cartoons for the sake of humor, on the same note, you don't draw controversial cartoons for the sake of controversy. Um, in fact, you know, that I carefully weigh some of my more controversial ideas by how much the element of the controversy itself is going to overshadow out of the point that I'm trying to make. Because the bottom line is these editorial cartoons are like advertisements and you're you're making a sales pitch and you want to sell your belief to the, the reading public. If a controversy overshadows the point that you're trying to make, then you lost the ability to make that sale. For instance, a, a good example of this is the, um, you know, drawing Muhammad. Uh, I, I can't see a circumstance where I would draw Muhammad only because the controversy of the image itself would overshadow anything that I was trying to say unless it was directed at the point I was trying to make. Um, so uh, where I, I agree with uh, Evelyn Beatrice Hall, who said that uh, I disapprove what you say, but I will defend your to the death your right to say it. There's a tactical reconstruction to political cartoons. And if you're just saying things to be controversial, to get notoriety, that's not my job. My job is to make a point and try to sell that point. Thanks, Michael. It's been a great interview. But we always end PRI's podcast on a happy note. And what better way to get in the mood for drawing a cartoon than enjoying a 
a glass of California wine. So please share with our leaders your recommendation for an adult beverage, a wine or a cocktail. So Ro, what you're saying is after looking at my cartoons, I must be a drunk to be able to come up with these <laughs> ideas, right? Well, some authors are. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to tell you, when I watch C-SPAN, it does lead to heavy drinking sometimes. And I thought about this and uh, I actually discovered a wine uh, that I love. It's a, it's called Dow, and the 2015 Cabernet is just the most delightful uh, red wine that I ever, ever had. And so right now, uh, they sell it at Costco and I've been looking for the 2015. You can find the 2016 in abundance. It's not as good, but uh, that's what I would recommend to your listeners. Thanks, Michael. You're welcome. Thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed it. Thanks again to our guests, Michael Ramirez and to Tim Anaya. To stay up to date with Michael Ramirez, go to his website at michaelpierramirez.com. If you like this episode, please tell your friends and subscribe to PRI's podcast at iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or TuneIn. And please do us a favor and give us five stars. You can also listen to our podcast on PRI's YouTube page, youtube.com slash pacificresearch1. That's a number one. Also, check out our blog, Right by the Bay, at our website at pacificresearch.org. Thanks for listening. I'm Rowena Ichon. We hope you'll come back again for another episode with PRI's podcast.